So, hello. Hi, Sabina. Hi, Peter. Hi. So, this is uh, Peter White. I'm here at Columbia University in New York City, and uh, we're going to be talking today about, uh, well, string theory and physics in general and what some of its problems and what maybe one can do about them. Um, so, uh, so, so Sabina, so, so maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and where are you now? Um, I'm presently in Germany. So I'm a theoretical physicist at Perimeter Institute, and, well, I'm currently traveling, which makes the connection a bit more complicated. And, well, as you probably know, besides trying to understand how the universe works or the academic system, uh, I'm writing a blog that's called Back Reaction together with my husband. Good. So um, I noticed that... Um, recently, you've mentioned on your blog occasionally that um, things have changed a bit since you published your book two years ago. So um, I thought maybe you could start with um, briefly summarizing what the situation was in which you wrote the book and uh, what you think has changed since. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so this book is, um, I guess what happened about two years ago is um, this book that I wrote appeared. It's called Not Even Wrong. And it, it appeared at the same time as a, a, a book by Lee Smolin, The Trouble with Physics. And kind of the appearance of the two books simultaneously, I think, meant that both of them got a lot more attention than the other one wise would have. And what um, both Lee and I, one of the things that we had in common in, the, in, the, in both books that we were concerned about was uh, the fact that there really had been very little progress in, in particle theory over the last 20, 25 years or so. And the subject has really come to be dominated by the by, by one kind of very particular, very speculative idea about how to unify physics, how to unify the theory, the so-called standard model of particle interactions, which is a, has been a huge success, and how to unify that with gravity and how to create a theory of quantum gravity. So there's one um, very speculative idea about how to do this by using so-called strings moving around. Instead of having particles, the elementary objects are supposed to be small strings vibrating and moving around in 10 dimensions. And that particular idea had gotten a lot of attention and a lot of effort had, has gone into it over the, since 1984 when it, it, it became very popular. And um, I think both Lee and, Lee and I um, had, had kind of the same perception, I think, which many people have had, that this, this really hasn't worked out very well and um, this, is a, this is a phenomenon kind of worth thinking about and writing about. So that was, uh, the, the books appeared about two years ago. And si since then, I think what's happened is that the, well, the, they got a, a lot of attention, and partly I also have a blog. My blog is called Not Even Wrong, and because of the books and the blog, uh, I think they, um, a, a lot of people kind of became aware of the fact that string theory has had, has had these problems, hasn't been working out as, as people ha had expected. At, at the same time, what, what happened in string theory itself, so independently of these kind of ar arguments that were happening in books and book reviews and the blogs, is string theory, um, a, a lot of string theorists had kind of started pursuing an, an idea about uh, about how to make sense of, of, of string theory, how to actually make it do something and, and work out, which is invoking a so-called multiverse to in, invoke uh, this kind of huge number of possible u universes. And the idea is that the reason string theory hadn't really been able to pr predict anything about our universe was that in some sense the things it would like to predict were inherently um, could not be predicted because they just varied from one universe to the next. And I think the combination of these two, of this, these two, uh, the, these two phenomena, this kind of this, this 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 criticism and the fact that the string theorists were coming up with this kind of explanation, which didn't sound very plausible to a, a lot of people. A lot of people were unhappy with this kind of um, uh, really changed a lot both the public perception of string theory and the perception of string theory among other physicists. There's a much more skepticism about the subject, and uh, the people doing it are, 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 I think, at this point, feeling very defensive. So, anyway, I don't know what the um, that that's pretty much the that's a lot of what's happened in the last last couple of years. And so, I think the the situation now is that st string theorists are, are are somewhat on the defensive. The the other thing that's going on is that the the LHC, this new accelerator in Geneva, is going to be starting up. You know, later this summer, early this fall, and I think a, a lot of the feeling now is that people in the subject kind of feel that well, they don't want to argue about this anymore, and they they don't want to try and deal with 
you know, what, what, what the issue is raised by it, instead just wait and see what happens at this accelerator. And the, the idea is that maybe experimental results from this accelerator will change the problem in some completely different way and, uh, and to e either, you know, come up with something which at least in some way vindicates the direction the string theorists have been trying to pursue, or maybe it will come up with something completely different and everybody will just forget string theory and do something completely different. So I think that's that's roughly what's been going on the last couple of years and what the current state state of it is. It's uh, the whole blog phenomenon has been part of it. There's been it's been a very strange experience, kind of running this blog and having these arguments and all sorts of odd things have happened over the last couple of years. And I think you've seen a lot of them on your blog too. So yeah, you you said that you wanted to draw attention to that phenomenon, and I was wondering what phenomenon is it actually that you were talking about? So is it that you have this field that has been around for more than 20 years and, uh, well, it didn't quite live up to its promises or is it that so many people are working on it? Well, it, it, it's a co combination of, of, of both. I think the, um, the I, I think it's been a very dangerous situation for the field to have this much, to have so much uh, of the, uh, of the kind of resources and the attention uh, uh, going into one one very particular idea, and you know, if, if this if this idea had been a huge success, that would be great, but but it really hadn't. Um, I mean, it really hasn't worked out as expected, and it's a uh, it, it's a very very technical subject. So I think it's very, I think many people are not really aware of what you know the extent to which things had not worked out or or, or what the actual state of the subject was. So one idea between the the blog and the book was to kind of in in, 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 in some detail, kind of try to you know, have a real discussion, lay out exactly what you know what the state of affairs is, what has what has worked, what hasn't worked, and um, try to at least to uh, try to get a discussion going about what um, you know an, an evaluation of what has happened and, and and what should be done given what has happened. And I, I think, unfortunately, I think I should say that there hasn't actually been. There, there, there are many ways which I think both um, both Lee and I have been disappointed that, that there there's been kind of a um, there there hasn't been a, the kind of the discussion I think both of us would really like to, to like to see that the um, while it, 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 it's become quite what people become much more aware of what these problems are the um, in terms of kind of having a, a real serious you know kind of scientific discussion of them and what uh, um, that that has that that's just been hard to get going. And, and, and instead, it's kind of just people have been kind of thrown on the defensive, and uh, you've had kind of fanatics on both sides kind of going going on, and and not the kind of kind of and, and publicly, I don't think you, we haven't seen as much as we would like of the kind of serious discussion that I, I think a lot of us see privately. That both both of us, when we talk to string theorists or other people privately, there's a you know there's, there's often a very interesting serious discussion where. You know, we agree on many things, and, and things we don't agree on, we can have an interesting discussion about. But it's been hard to get that that to happen publicly. Yeah, um, you know what puzzles me about this is that it apparently wasn't possible to um, have such an assessment about the perceived and actual promise of the program within the community, but that this discussion had to go um, through the public. In these books, in the blogs, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's that's a very it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And um, one one thing about it was that it at, at the beginning when these books first came out, one of the initial reactions of of string theorists was to say, well, well, just that look, the, these these guys just have um, you know they've lost the you know the, the the battle in the marketplace of ideas, and so they're now trying to uh, you, know, you know try to go around and by publishing popular books, trying trying to change this. But I, I think what, what's actually happened over the last couple of years is, you know, as through the blogs and through discussion of the books, there has been uh, this kind of change and a much more skepticism about string theory. And and string theorists have, in in many ways, kind of been been losing the the. Uh, the, the ongoing battle in the marketplace of ideas that's been happening in the last couple of years, so you, you don't hear that um, complaint so much. But they're really, you're right. I, mean, I think that's an interesting question. Is, is that there was? A, it's very hard to know what the right, um, you know, what, what the right place for such di for such discussions is. And uh, it's it's true that they really are discussions that are very technical in many ways, and that 
need to need to be between you know p people who are kind of knowledgeable about the subject, but but they're not um they they, they really they really kind of kind of weren't happening, and so 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 they, they ended, so so what ended up driving them was was to some extent these popular books. So I don't, I don't know really what what you th what do you think of that what. Well, think? speaking of the marketplace of ideas, um, I think, well, the whole term in itself is kind of misguided. Um, but one thing that's very specific about um, the scientific community, whatever field you are working in, is that um, scientists judge on themselves. So I a priori see no good um, reason why such a discussion should involve the public because it becomes very polemic and it um, concerns me a lot actually that it apparently was not possible to um, lead this discussion within the community and it seems to indicate to me that this idea of the marketplace of uh, ideas doesn't, doesn't work out quite well the way the academic system is set up right now because it, it seems to me that um, the natural way uh, this discussion should have been led um, didn't work out. And yeah. that's the problem. So if one um, then addresses it to the public, um, it, it causes kind of a threat, right? So some of the yeah. um, comments that I recall were things that very obviously indicated that people were concerned about their funding yeah. and um, not only on the string theory side but very generally on the theoretical physics side because it's like well you know it could damage the whole reputation of the field and I can kind of relate to that it's not a way that um, such a discussion should have been led yeah no, no I, I agree it's really not that's true, but it, the, the problem is it's, it's hard to see kind of how... Uh, I don't know, did you have an interpretation of this? Did you, uh, why do you think that this discussion didn't happen in a, a way that, it, would, that it, it kind of should, should have? Well, I, th I think there are various reasons, and um, I, I think one of the main points in Lee's book was that he tried to address these causes so um, this was the, the last part of the book that probably yeah. most of the people didn't read and I, I think the point is just that there are the academic system is quite complex and it should have some mechanism that um, allows people to um direct with their interests where um, where work goes, where money goes um, and how the field develops and um, for, for such a system to work it needs to set up it need, needs to be set up properly and I don't think this is presently the case I mean you have, you have a situation in where money goes where people go and uh, the people go where the money goes, and yeah. um, the people who work on the field basically judge on themselves through peer review, through um, writing reports on grant proposals, and so on and so forth. And this is a way you can perfectly create big bubbles of nothing, in which people just tell themselves how great they are, and yeah. there is there is no um, natural. Um, way you could stop this process? Yeah, I guess it, it's this is the well. W one thing that kind of fascinates me is that I, you know, I, so I spent I started out my career in a, in a physics department, getting my PhD in particle theory. But for the last twenty years or so, I've been in the mathematics. I've been working in the math department and in the math community, and there there are many of the same many of the same pressures. There's the same. There's some of the same pressures of money. There's 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 similar. Um, the way grants work is, is quite similar in, in, in mathematics and physics, um, and both are both are very very demanding, very difficult, and very specialized subjects. And a lot of what is is determined kind of by peer review and the way academic hiring is is, is done is, is is more or less similar. But ma mathematics has has been very has been quite successful over the last twenty years. It's, it's done very well. We find there have been these proofs of things like the Poincaré conjecture and the 
Claremont's last theorem, and so it, it's 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 not um it's not necessarily really in, in a golden age, but it's certainly a very healthy subject at, at this point, even while facing a lot of the same problems as physics. So it, it's something I, I don't completely understand. I've, I've thought a lot about about why why things seem to be working, doing going going better in um, in, in, in in math departments, and um, one reason is uh. What, 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 one of the problems that, that is, I think is, is very, has been a very serious problem for a long time in, in particle theory is actually the, this job situation, that the the number of PhDs being produced is kind of vastly greater than the, the, the number of kind of reasonable academic jobs doing research that people can, can expect to find, probably something like in the ratio of 10 to 1. So you have people getting their PhDs and immediately under kind of huge pressures if they want you know, to continue to continue to, to do what they're doing, to um, to do everything exactly right, and to and and you know to, to make kind of this one chance in ten, and by doing doing everything exactly right, generally means you know it means that you you are, are often have to work on, on exactly what the most popular or what the hottest topic of the day is. If you decide to go off and do something which different, which sounds interesting to you, you're you mean, it's almost certainly a kind of career suicide. So that's the, the situation. In mathematics is, is nowhere near as bad. There's you know, this, it, good jobs are still hard to get. It's still a fairly competitive subject, but it, it, it's nowhere near as dramatic a situation. So I was wondering if you had the same you know, perception of, of that problem. Um, well, I actually uh, don't have very much context to uh, postdocs in mathematics, but it's um, it's definitely true that the competitive pressure in theoretical physics is very high. And this kind of promotes this whole process because it puts an enormous pressure on people. And, um, well, if you think of it as some kind of natural selection process, it just works very rapidly. And the yeah. people who survive are, in the end, those that do well within the system, which um, also reinforces the processes of that system. So um, it's kind of a problem that... Uh, doesn't go away by itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that there is a, there, there's also there is kind of in, in a weird way kind of a different culture in mathematics and in in physics. And I think the the culture of physics has has always been that um, you know that the smartest people want to be working on on the same thing that the other smart people are are, are working on. And uh, I think I think Lear also writes about this in, in, in his, his in his book. The, there's this kind of feeling that well the, the way for a field to make progress is to kind of have one kind of problem of the day which which everybody then kind of jumps on and tries to solve and then that's the way the field is tradi- kind of traditionally made made progress and I, I think as long as the subject was being kind of driven by experiment as what was happening was there's some new experimental data and some some new kind of clue about what was going on with nature that was that was driving this, and everybody was trying to understand what this clue meant. It uh, it made a certain amount of sense, and progress was made. But now that the situation become much more difficult, we just don't have the same kind of experimental clues helping us. It um, it, it's become a, a, a bit dysfunctional. And instead, you you have everybody kind of pursuing the same idea, even when it, it's just a you know perhaps just some you know relatively random, highly speculative idea, not particularly based upon any experimental evidence. Whereas um, mathematics has always had much more of a culture of people, people spreading out, and um, it's consi- it, it, it's considered not a good idea at all if somebody comes up with some new idea for for you to immediately jump on it and try to write a, a paper about it. That's con- considered a fairly odd thing to thing to do. Whereas in, in physics, it's, it's much more the, the normal behavior. But I, I don't really know what um, I don't really know what can be what can be done to change this. I mean, what do you think can be? If this really is a kind of problem, what do you think can be done to... Well, for one, I don't think that um, um, that this jumping on fashionable topics is um, a priori a very bad thing. So there, need, there needs to be the kind of people who do that. Uh, the problem is just if too many people do it. And uh, one of the reasons why I think people do it is because this competitive, competitive pressure is so high and also because the funding of positions typically is very short. So you need to yeah. pick a topic that produces some outcome in a very short time. And that, I think, yeah. is a serious problem, especially if you um, consider that um, the share of postdocs, um, I mean, the share from academic researchers is constantly increasing. 
I think I, I was recently looking at the numbers from the National Science Foundation and uh, it's that um, the number of the percentage of postdocs has increased from 13 percent to 27 percent from 73 to 2005 or something like this. Okay, that's and and me meanwhile, meanwhile, the, the number of uh, full time faculty members has dropped. So there's more and more weight shifting into um, short term uh, employments. And of course, typically the, the topics that the people will work on are um, topics that will fit into this constraint. Yeah. And, and this very obviously favors these, uh, these um, tendencies to jump on a topic that comes up and that um, will very likely be interesting uh, and where many people will um, cite you if you write one of the first papers and um, so that that's the way you produce more bubbles and if well if you look at the archive then you can see examples for exactly that kind of thing yeah, and then, yeah that's interesting I guess I hadn't thought so much about that it, it, it's true just in general if you're thinking about how both subjects both mathematics and physics are are funded it, it's a lot easier to um, it's a lot easier to get kind of short-term funding, and it's a lot easier. Postdocs are relatively cheap, and you're committing money for only uh, a small number of years, so it's pretty easy to find. It's relatively easy to find, you know, government agencies or private people or whatever who uh, who want to uh, to fund a postdoc. Whereas funding a kind of permanent position for you know to, to pay somebody a, a fairly reasonably re reasonably se senior salary for the re and and promise it to them for the rest of their life is uh, is much much harder to. Uh, find funding for that so I think there's been a general there's a general trend in American universities to have, have fewer and fewer kind of permanent full-time faculty and more and more um, adjuncts or, or, or people who are working on a on short-term contracts uh, actually so me I wanted to ask you a bit also about the um, where you're working now at the perimeter Institute one thing is how, how long are when people are, are hired if you can say a little bit about that and when people are hired there how long are they hired for and well um, I'm on a three-year uh, postdoc uh, contract, so uh, I've been there for two years, and I have one more year to go. Um, we also have um, five-year postdoc positions, and then there's senior and junior faculty. Yeah. So that's the situation that there is right now. But um, y since you were talking about um, um, the the faculty uh, in the United States who hire postdocs, so one. One other problem that, that comes with this kind of setup is that typically postdocs are hired for a certain purpose, for a certain program. They work with a supervisor. So this yeah. is one thing we do not have at Perimeter, which I okay. think is good because it makes you like more independent, right? So you're basically free to work on whatever you like and you don't have to, um, well, to care about what the faculty members do. Well, and good. it makes it makes a huge difference because otherwise, um, well, whether you like that or not, you'll be influenced. Um, yeah. By, by the by the topics that are already around. And yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, since we're talking about um, private institutes, uh, one of my um, former supervisors uh, funded an institute that's the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh huh. That's what it's called. So um, what they are doing is um, it's um, at the intersection of theoretical physics. So that that's mostly nuclear physics uh, and um, nanoscience and chemistry, I think. And they have a very similar setup. Um, well, they call it junior and senior fellows. Um, so the, the junior fellows are kind of the, the postdocs, but they are not assigned to a specific supervisor. So the idea behind this is quite similar. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, I think this whole phenomenon of kind of private or spe special institutes, especially ones funded by private money, is kind of is kind of very interesting. I think it's going to ch change what how this field looks like in the, in the coming years. There's this new institute being funded out at Stony Brook on devoted to mathematics and physics, which. I think, yeah, I think it's quite, you quite interesting. That, yeah. Yeah, and it's being funded by um, Jim Simons, who's perhaps the most successful um, hedge fund manager in the world and has many, many billions of dollars to his name. And he's already put 
you know, quite a, quite a bit of money up um, promised for this, and he, he clearly has more. And if if this works out, can probably be convinced to spend even more on the subject. So it's um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. It, it, it's just getting started, but they really are in the interesting position, I think, of, of money not really being monetary constraints not being su- such a big deal. And they, they really can they have to figure out what they're going to do do with this and how to organize themselves and. Uh, I, th- I think perimeter, I guess, uh, is perhaps a, a little bit similar. It's also um, private money, and so th- in some sense, this these institutes are just answerable to, to some wealthy person, which um, doesn't initially sound like maybe this is such a great idea. I mean, maybe you know the, the, the funding or the or, or the, the way the community is organized and where its resources come from should be you know, the, the government or, the, or, or or people or some much more democratic means and having everything depend upon some small number of very wealthy people. So it seems a, a dangerous situation, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I think as far as I can tell, Perimeter seems to have been somewhat of a success, and this Stony Brook Simon Center look, looks like a very interesting idea. So I think it's going to... I don't know. What, what do you think will happen in, in, in the future? What do you think about this private money and wealthy people? Yeah, um... Things? Well, I'm I'm a bit skeptical about it. So one thing about Perimeter is actually that uh, half of the money roughly comes from governmental sources. So um, ju- just to mention that. But um, I well I I share your impression that um, it can work quite well. Um, but there's also a bit of a danger behind that in that if governmental sources would like at some point. Um, uh, well, say, see, there's all this private money being poured into um, yeah. research, so we don't have to do this anymore. Then right. there is potentially the danger that um, very wealthy people can um, have an influence on the direction where research goes, just by funding specific things and not others. Yeah. So that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. But um, potentially the problem is there. Yeah. No, Actually, this is true. You but know, speak, speaking of wealthy people funding research, I, I just read this morning in, in uh, the newspaper that uh, John Templeton died yesterday. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I think he, he just died yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So that's also a very interesting story. So he's, he's certainly very heavily funded the um, all sorts of things that have to do with uh, science and religion and with... Uh, Bringing science and religion together, which is something I'm rather skeptical about. He he, he also has put puts put some smaller sums of money in, into into more pure theoretical research. There's this FQXI organization which he is involved in. His um, foundation was involved in funding and presumably will keep funding. So that's that's I think been kind of a, a mixed bag. But but he, he, that's definitely shows that I think the danger that um he has a very definite point of view, which is not clearly a, a good point of view for for a healthy point of view for science which is to get it together with religion and uh, he's I think his foundation has had quite an effect there yeah. anyway so that's is it, w- one other topic I wanted to, to talk about maybe we should get back to talking about blogs and uh, the internet and stuff yeah, I guess you're, you're organizing this um, conference uh, that's coming up and do you want to talk a little bit about that and say what that's about um, yeah, so the, the conference is, um, is titled Science in the 21st Century, um, Science, Society, and Information Technology, and that's what it is about. So it's basically um, about the influence that technological developments have on the way science is done. So that, that includes things like uh, the future of scientific collaboration, um, this open access stories and so on and so forth. It also includes the blogosphere. <laughs> yes. And there are actually there are quite several of the participants are bloggers. So, um, well, I think that some of these developments that have taken place are not necessarily good and one um, has to think about what these effects are. Yeah, and so yeah, so, so what do you what do you think about the the what are your thoughts about the effects of the blogosphere? Since we've both been running these blogs, I'm curious to to kind of compare the thoughts to what your you know, what your impressions have been when dealing with it for the last couple of few years. 
Well, um, right now I would say that the blogosphere does not really have a major influence on um, the community in that very little people seem to follow it. It's it's a matter of age, though. I mean, if I if I am at a conference or something, then it it happens more and more often that um, people come and say, "Hey, I'm reading your blog." Yeah, yeah. But yeah. these are these are mostly the younger people. Younger people, yeah. Yeah, um, but I think I mean this connectivity is a very powerful tool, and it definitely has the potential to influ influence opinions. And you can see this in what you like to call like uh, this week's hype. So yeah. uh, this is not necessarily entirely constrained to the blogosphere. So the blogosphere is a bit more special in this regard. But um, this, of course, influences people. And um, one has to be careful with that. So yeah. it's, it, it kind of um, supports this um, growth of bubbles that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, so in, in principle, it, it, it blogs, I guess, could, could just kind of all kind of talk about the same subject and just kind of amplify you yeah. know, prob probably an unhealthy interest in the, too much interest in the same subject and probably quite possibly having there have been too many blogs discussing too much about string theory and that's not, not <laughs> it'd be better if they ignored it and talked about different things. Um, yeah, you know what? What sometimes strikes me is that there is a certain disconnect that I think uh, many people who don't work in the field don't actually realize that that, that um, the topics that are typically discussed on blogs or in 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 popular magazines or whatever are not topics that you actually discuss with your colleagues. Yeah. So th this always strikes me a bit odd, and this this impression that people get um, is like really distorted. So I've been asked repeatedly uh, when it comes to parameter, is like you have string theorists and you have people working on loop quantum gravity. Do they get along with each well, other? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so people seem to have this impression that we avoid each other on the corridor or something like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the whole, you know, I mean, there, that's certainly been the, the oddest thing in my experience the, with, with blogs with some of this uh, kind of relatively insane kind of behavior and this controversy over string theory is really, really kind of, I feel I find it very odd because, uh, again, personally, you know, I have many friends who are string theorists. I have, have never really in the past had problems kind of privately, very, having a very interesting and a polite and conversation with anybody about string theory and we actually agree about a lot and and so we at the end ending up having these kind of over the top kind of often kind of juvenile behavior and kind of strange um, personal attacks and controversy going on it, 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 it's just kind of bizarre it, it, it's not something that you normally uh, see in uh, in kind of in, in, in real academic life it's a it's a little bit of a I don't know, anyway it's not some strange kind of show going on and um And, it, and it's certainly drawn a lot of attention, and, and, and that attention has not, I think you're right, it's not been good for theoretical physics in general, and it's certainly not been good for, for string theory. I think it hasn't made that subject. Yeah, what, so what, what, this is one of the reasons why I said earlier that it probably wasn't so good to um, lead this discussion uh, by involving the public because it really polarizes people. Yeah. No, that's true. It's... um. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. I mean, discussions like this, these these subjects are actually very complex. And that, that's one one problem I continually have, have with the blog is there are a lot of people who want to kind of write in comments and argue about this who really don't know much about what's going on and want to have a very very oversimplified view of it. And it's uh, yeah, you, ha you have to kind of kind of resist that. And that's, I mean, but that that's just kind of an inherent in, in trying to talk about these these things in public. You have to kind of uh, you're forced to kind of um, To, to, to kind of make this a much more simplistic thing than it is. Well, then, then uh, why do you think that um, the situation has uh, a bit changed now since the book was published? Do you think that the reason really is that, um, you know, there has been a better in-depth in discussion of these topics, or is it just that there's generally this sense of, look, these books have been published and people are saying... Um, there are too many people working on the field and it uh, doesn't make predictions and, uh, you know, all, all this stuff that has been said and maybe we should better not invest more money into this. And uh, Well, I guess that also um, young uh, students are influenced by this kind of discussion 
at least, if, well, if I was now at the stage where I uh, would try to decide for maybe a PhD topic or something like this, I would probably pay attention to this. Yeah. yeah well, well, actually, I, mean, I think one reason both Lee and I wrote these books was that there, I mean, there, there was a public discussion of string theory going on, but it was a very much a completely one-sided one. I mean, there was a lot of effort going into promoting string theory, and there were a lot of, you know, some quite good popular books, like my colleague Brian Green's book, which is a very well done book, but 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 which is very much giving a one side of the story. So there was there was a huge kind of public promotional effort um, behind string theory, and string theorists I think always had have always had a problem in, in academia and in physics departments that there's some skepticism about the, there's been skepticism from their colleagues about the subject about the fact that it doesn't make predictions. So they've kind of always had to adopt a certain amount of um, kind of a kind of a political technique of kind of uh, st sticking together and, and, and being in many ways defensive and kind of always, you know, and never say a bad thing about another string theorist or never say a bad thing about string theory. So there was th this kind of one-sided um, view of the subject both in the, you know, in, in the very public sphere, which you're talking about a very low-level discussion, but even in the, uh, you know, in, 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 in more in the academic sphere, in discussions am among physicists, I, I don't think that physicists who are not working on, um, you know, who are, who are not that well informed about about string theory itself, were, were, were had any way in which they they actually heard that there really was another side of the story. They saw this kind of large promotional effort being made at all levels to uh, about you know what was, you know, what the successes of string theory were, or what why you should be doing this, and there there really wasn't anywhere that. That 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 that, yeah, that anybody at, at any level could kind of learn what the problems with the subject were. So, actually, when I wrote the book, it, it, the, the book the book that I wrote is, is actually I think a little bit odd, and I was surprised that it was so easy that it was relatively easy to get it published. And that some of it is written so that pretty much anybody can understand. It's written for a very general audience. Parts of it are are actually quite specialized and, and actually make kind of much more specialized points. And um, I hope that and and, and I, I've been pleased that you know that, that a lot of people. Both physicists and mathematicians have kind of ha have read the book and actually have have learned uh, and, and something about the more, a more subtle view of what the uh, of what the problems of the of the subject are. But anyway, it's the um, maybe we should get back to. The yeah, wait, about one the one thing about what you just said because you made it sound as if this was some kind of uh, deliberate development um, that you couldn't really find out what the problem were with string theory, whereas I would have thought this is more a consequence of um, a specialization in the field, um, which kind of happens naturally if the field grows that people have less time to talk to each other and they will try to, well, you know, focus on their own research field and probably neglect talking to others. So it's not a good development that I think one should act against, but uh, I don't think this is, you know, kind of deliberate. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I think that there, there's two things. One, one is the question of specialization and the question of the uh, just, well, one is the question of specialization, and this is true throughout academia. This is also true in mathematics. In mathematics, it's, it's harder and harder for mathematicians to um you know, to communicate with each other, to understand what the person down the hall is doing, and when you're trying to hire somebody, a new person in the department, to understand what their research is about, what the implications of it are. So that that's a problem in all subjects. And and again, I, I find it interesting to contrast to mathematics and see how that mathematicians are. You know, it's a problem for them, but but they're, they're I think they're dealing with it better than than physicists were. The string theory, I think, is in some sense a special case though, because it, it, it's really a it's not just specialized, but it, it's the sheer complexity of the subject is, is really just remarkable. One of the things that most surprised me when I started talking to, to people about this and arguing about it, and I started communicating with some some very well-known people, some, some some Nobel Prize-winning theorists about this, and you know, asking them what they thought, and I was surprised to get the reaction from some of them that their reaction was, "Look, you know, I really don't understand this stuff very well, so I'm I'm not comfortable kind of evaluating what's going on and." I don't, you know, maybe this is working, maybe it isn't, but I just really can't tell. It's so difficult. And, and, and I'm not talking about random people. I'm talking about, you know, absolutely, if somebody if somebody gives you a list of who are the top few, very few theoretical physicists in the world, they would be on the list. And these people are telling me, I don't really understand what's going on here, and, and I'm uncomfortable with this. So I think string theory is a very unusual subject because of that. It's, it's now got this, 
you know, 20, 30 some year history of, of, of people trying to do many, many different kinds of things. It's a very complicated subject. There isn't, when you say string theory, there really isn't a single simple thing that you're talking about. You're talking about this huge variety of efforts, what to do. And um, so how you, how, how, how do you evaluate such a research program, and which, which is just so complex and so poorly understood by, uh, by most people? And most people, one, one reason most people aren't in the position to, you know, to, to, to evaluate what's going on is, is just that the, 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 um, the mathematics often used is, is, is quite sophisticated. So, I mean, one advantage I've had, at least in, in kind of thinking about it and trying to learn about it, is at least the mathematical background I've accumulated over the last... 20 some years kind of allows me to I can at least deal with, with, with that part of it better than a lot of people but it's it's still um, it's very very difficult and so, so the question is under this circumstance when it's so hard for anybody outside the field to have any idea what's going on in it I, I think this this actually requires that the, the people who are actually doing it you know need, need to kind of you know be they're the ones who, who they, they need to be a lot more honest about about how about evaluating about about about, this, about figuring out what's actually working and what isn't working and and you know and you know communicating the um, conclusions that can be drawn about this to other people, and that's that's the thing which I think I think bothered both Lee and me that we weren't seeing that happening that we would see you're seeing that instead the people doing this were behaving this kind of very defensive. You know, d- d- def- defensive way, and, and, and totally kind of un- unwilling to acknowledge what the problems were, and often even unaware themselves of, of what the problems were. I think Lee points out several examples of, you know, some very technical, difficult facts about this theory, about what it can do and what it can't do, that even people within the subject are not very well aware of. So, string theory is such a huge thing that even most string theorists, I think, are not in such a great position to even evaluate what's going on. And it's a, it's a very complicated business and. Well, the the problem is that the way the academic system is currently set up, it doesn't it doesn't reward that kind of behavior. It doesn't reward yeah. that kind of critical assessment. It doesn't reward you to um, if you're if you're not working in the field to look into the details and uh, be critical about it. There's just no place for that. So what what people do is that they they advertise um, their own stuff yeah. and. Yeah, so that's that's how it happens. Uh, to me, this is a system failure. It it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with string theory. String theory is just uh, well, it's just one example, and it's maybe a very extreme example, but um, it could have happened in other cases. I mean, you said that that the field is very it's very large and very complex and so on, but one has to one has to ask whether the reason. For that, it's just that so much money and people were put into this field. So if you had done the same thing with some other field, maybe this field would have uh, grown to such size and complexity that it would be hard to judge on it as an outsider. Yeah, that, 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 that's true. I mean, so a lot of the complexity is just from the having so many people work on it for, for, for so long. I guess one... Um, yeah. Well, another way of saying that is that it, it, the one problem with string theory is, is it never. It, so it started out with a certain speculative idea, and then that didn't really quite work out the way people had hoped. So they kind of have kept looking for for, for different things. So there's been a, a very long history now of kind of wandering around, trying different different things and different ways of thinking about this, and um, that's what's driven a lot of the complexity. It, it, it's actually interesting. There's an interesting relation to mathematics in the sense that. This has actually been good for mathematics. If, if, if string theory had had actually just been, you know, one there's one particular idea people had, you know, investigated that and learned something about it and worked or didn't work, then that would have been one particular mathematical structure would have been studied by physicists and maybe might have been interesting, might not. But instead, we've had all these very very smart people for 20 years wandering around um, a very very kind of mathematically rich area of asking all sorts of questions that mathematicians hadn't really thought about before. And so, um, so math, one, one reaction I get from my mathematician colleagues when I tell, tell them about my criticism of string theory is they kind of look very puzzled and go, well, you know, what's, what's the problem? It's, you know, as far as, as, as I've seen, it's had all these wonderful effects or all these interesting ideas that have come out of it. And so, um, you know, where, where's the problem? And, and it really hasn't been a problem at all for mathematics. It's been very good for mathematics. But it's been, um, it has been a problem for physics. And 
And well, well you, have, you have to ask yourself whether all of the people who have been working on it uh, have been necessary for that. So, yeah. see, I, I have no specific problem with string theory. I, I think it's a very uh, interesting topic and certainly lots of stuff has come out of it. So especially this uh, ADS-CFT stuff I find um, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. There must be some, some core group of people who actually do the relevant work. And then there are probably thousands of people who just uh, jumped on that train and work on um, very specific subjects uh, because this is where the funding is. Yeah, yeah because no. it's because it's easy if you write a proposal and it says something with string theory. This is an established research project, and you are likely to get the money. Yeah, no, that, that's true, but. But I, I guess I, I guess I'm also a little bit of a, in some ways, a, an elitist. That I, I think a lot of traditionally, I mean, the, the best, the, the greatest progress in a lot of these very difficult subjects comes from a, you know, a fairly, a relatively small number of a very of the most talented people in the field. And uh, what's happened with string theory is not just that there's been this huge, kind of wide, that you've got 2,000 people doing it, but that it's so dramatically. Um, Taken over as some of the the, you know, the really elite institutions that train some, some of the best young people, and and so I mean I'm most aware of that. I was a student at uh, at Harvard and at Princeton, and uh, especially now at, at at Princeton, for instance, in recent years, essentially all of the uh, theoretical physics faculty there is doing string theory. If you're a, if you're a student, if you're an American student in the subject, often you know Princeton is one of the places you would most like to to go and to start a career and get trained. But if you do this, there's not a re really way to start a career and get trained in anything else except in string theory if you want to pursue particle theory. And I think that's what's been a, a huge problem. So to me, the yeah, question is, you know, that's is how you true. change that. Yeah, Yeah. since since you mentioned the, the problem of training, this, this is another problem that I see with the academic system, that it's incredibly hard to change the topic once yeah. you have started. So you, you make a PhD in some field, then the only people you know are like your supervisor and his or her friends and you get kind of handed over to your first postdoc and then you make a second postdoc and at some yeah. point you've, you've worked in whatever field it is for like five, six years and these are where you get the letters from and so on and you ju don't just turn around and say well now I work on something completely different because you will never get a job there. Yeah. So th this makes it incredibly hard uh, for people to really freely choose what they are interested in. Yeah, no, no, I think, but but, but I think that's, that's a general problem. Though. That's not that's not just true of physics. This is true of, of academia in general. That it's uh, people become. I mean, th these are often intellectually very demanding subjects, and it's, it's hard to become expert in something. So people. Are, are encouraged yeah, to just become specialized and become expert in, in in one thing, and then there's there really isn't a, a reward for or, or a career path for kind of uh, easily mo moving on to something else. That your the the reward structure is all um, set up about to try to exploit yeah. your expertise in, uh, in in this one particular thing that you were trained at from the beginning, and um, and, and and it really is most comfortable actually to. Once you become expert at something, to kind of keep doing that and to kind of keep um, keep exploiting that expertise, it's a lot more comfortable than kind of starting out and starting out ignorant and uh, not knowing what you're doing and in some other subject. It's a it's a very difficult thing to do, and I think I think you're right that it's a very hard thing to encourage people to do, and that's been some of the story of string theory that there hasn't been people need to be encouraged to, to try to come up with to, to try to do some very different things, and there's. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Do you have any? Do you have any ideas about what one can do to kind of encourage people to, to have well, this? Well, well, one of field? the things we, one of the points that I think would address this problem is um, what we also mentioned earlier that um, well, you you should kind of um, um, reward people for doing good research um, without tying them to a specific program or to a supervisor yeah. so they could actually change what they are working on. See, if, if you have an education in, well, string theory, for example, um, then people will hire you for a position um, in string theory. Yeah. 
an right, art yeah. proposition is something different. But if you kind of um, have the idea, the next thing I want to work on is condensed matter, then yeah. you also cannot apply for a position in condensed matter because they will never hire you. Right, so right, instead yeah. what you can do is you can just... Um, well, finance people who do good research, no matter what they do. And then they yeah. are kind of free to uh, decide, well, now I'm fed up with this topic. I want to try something different. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. I, 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 I've always, you know, I find it very worrisome to see kind of positions and institutes and, you know, that, that, they're, that are specifically devoted to a certain subject, you know, to have, and you, you often see kind of job ads where people are specifically advertising that I, we want to hire you know somebody doing string theory in the um i think that there's a tradition very much and it's more in physics than in mathematics and ma that uh, of kind of targeting positions at specific uh specific specific fields and so um and instead of just trying to hire w one model for hiring is to always go out and try to just hire the, the you know the best person that you can find the other model is to go and try to target some area and say we want to hire, you know, people in this, in this specific area, and then we'll take what we can get in that area. And I, th I think you're right. It's, um, well, pe people need to be convinced to, to, uh, to, 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 to try to do as much as possible, you know, encourage smart people, no, no matter what they're doing. Uh, and f unfortunately, I, th I think what's happening now, what I see is, is the, um, there's kind of this negative pressure. I think what's happening to string theorists is, is they're finding that as people become much more skeptical about it, um, and they kind of you know, don't aren't aren't are too too interested in in uh, cha changing to something else. That there's this this, this negative selection effect that your know, jobs are just dry, drying up. And I think if um, it's especially been dramatic in this country in the last year or so that if you look at the people getting hired into um, tenure track, you know, potentially permanent jobs in the subject, the it used to be quite a few strength theorists were, were getting these jobs, and I think this year it's uh, essentially none. So it's a uh, um, well, yeah, unfortunately, what, what, what's happening is that I think there's going to be pressure on people to, to change what they're doing or to just by the fact that people will not, you know, aren't going are, are gonna to start targeting or are starting to targeting their, their hiring in, in other subjects and in, in, in so-called phenomenology, not in um, not in string theory. I don't know if you've noticed anything about that. and uh, Have you noticed any trend like that? Or what is, um, is, is there any particular... Ideas that perimeter has, has perimeter targeted. It, does it kind of target its hiring in certain areas, or has that changed, or what did they do? Um, well, we have we have various groups there, and the place is supposed to grow, but I don't know um, what they will be targeting. Yeah. So, well, I'm a phenomenologist. And I've been hired somewhere in the middle range between quantum gravity and particle physics, I guess. Yes. But as a phenomenologist, I feel a bit lonely in this group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I kind of share your perception that um, the trend is kind of going towards phenomenology. And it's been going there actually for quite a while. So at least since, well, you know, 2000, where the stuff with the extra dimensions came out. Yes. Um, 98, 99, um, um, Akanyamit, Demopoulos, Tuali, um, Randall Zundram, this kind of thing, um, what they called string phenomenology. Right. And then some years later, um, there was this um, quantum gravity phenomenology idea that came up with the form special relativity that um, created a lot of attention. Yeah. And, um, well, if you check the archive nowadays, um, you see that the word phenomenology is used like always and everywhere, whether it's appropriate or not. Or not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm kind of afraid this will just, um, well, become another fashionable topic. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think people are, are very, very much aware of what the fashions are and of, of what the, you know, the pressures are. And, and it's clear, I think... See, it seems to me within particle theory that the, the pressures within the last few years have been towards anything that be, can be considered phenomenology or especially anything that be, can, can have any relationship to the LHC. So you see yeah. a lot of string theorists are actually kind of going to fairly amazing lengths to try to somehow relate their work that they've been doing to the LHC, even if, yeah. uh, even if it's hard to support this. And um, 
and, and, and one, I guess one, one of the other things to say about the reaction to my book and to this critique of strength theory is that I, I think that there's been an, an unfortunate misunderstanding of, of some of what um, of, of the points that I think Lee and I were trying to, to make. The, it, it's certainly very true that the string theory hasn't wor- worked out, and in some sense, the, the evidence for the fact that it, it hasn't worked out the way people want it is that it, it's, it's un- unable to predict it, anything. And that's that's the the kind of bottom line of how you judge a scientific research program after um, you know a- after many years. But it, it, it's kind of worse than that. In some sense, the problem is just not that it's not out there producing a lot of equations that make predictions. The problem has been that it really hasn't. What what you want to see in a research program is that it um, not necessarily that it, it's making predictions, but 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 that it, but it's somehow moving in that direction. That the things people are conjecturally trying to do are, are are kind of leading somewhere and they're leading in, in, in some positive direction and that's what I think that's in some sense the problem with string theory not that it hasn't made predictions but it doesn't even seem to be moving towards making predictions and and the general my general feeling about what 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 what, what, I, what I wish you know there, there's some way to figure out how to ma- make more possible within the subject is to, is to get people thinking about a wider range of ideas that this is this is one idea that it's got a huge of attention, amount of attention, and hasn't led to what you want. So you should be trying, trying something else. And and and, and personally, the, the, the sort of thing that I find most promising, since since you don't actually have you don't have experiment you don't have interesting experimental results that disagree with the standard model. So you can't you, you, you shouldn't be completely motivated by experimental results because there aren't there aren't really very many to think about. So you you have to kind of make progress in other ways, not by worrying about about direct contact with phenomenology and the experiment, but 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 worrying about the actual kind of deep structural problems of of the field. And there's this, the um, the whole subject that of particle theory is now built upon these quantum field theories, these gauge theories. And if you start digging into them and, and digging into their mathematical structure, they're actually very very poorly understood subjects. I mean, we we know how to do certain kinds of calculations, but there's just huge amounts of things about these theories which we just don't understand at all. And uh, there, there's a lot of Things to do, and, and a lot of things I think where mathematics could uh, could help a lot. I mean, the, the, the relations between quantum field theory and mathematics are just really incredibly deep and spectacular. And uh, there, and string theory has brought a little bit of it, but there's a huge amount there. So I, I'm actually ca- kind of sad to see this trend of um, people moving away from mathematics and moving away from more formal investigations of the subject, and, and kind of saying, well, we want to do something that's directly related to experiment. Otherwise, we're not going to hire people, and, and that, that I think is a, is not a good thing. So I don't know what you, you have any thoughts about that. Or well, um, I'm very skeptic about trends in general. So I totally don't like this idea trying to direct uh, any um, research at all. So I would... For me, the optimal situation would be to just let people do what they want to do and what their interests are, and um, you know, not trying to hire people for specific positions, not trying to um, invest in specific research programs, and so on and so forth. I mean, the problem is that um, scientific research is very fragile in that um, we have only ourselves to judge on each other. So it it needs to be as unbiased as possible and not um, directed by any external constraints. And there are many potential influences that one can have. So peer pressure is one. But there's also um, financial influence. And then there's also, of course, the influence from the public because, after all, like scientists are human and we read new newspapers and we read blogs yeah. and so on and so forth and um, well one one has to make sure that this um, influence doesn't negatively affect um, scientific direction so one has to try to keep it as um, small as possible and this is just presently not the case um, the way yeah. the academic system works and I think this is a problem so there was you know that the the word ivory tower is now kind of um, used in quite a cynical way for yeah, the yeah. for the academic researcher who is disconnected from what people do in the real world and so on and so forth 
but there was actually a reason for this ivory tower. Ivory tower, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So exactly th that um, researchers are not influenced by politics, financial pressure, and so on and so forth. And um, it's kind of um, yeah. So this this um, um, detachment is kind of um, going away. And yeah. um, this is, uh, well, on one side, it's a good thing because I, um, especially in theoretical physics, I find it very nice to see that it's really getting closer to the public, also through the blogs. Yeah. That's why I'm writing one. But this has potential disadvantages that uh, one has to uh, look at. So this is one of the reasons for this conference that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, 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 I see. I see. Yeah, no, it's a... It's a very complicated question about how to, yeah, how, what the, what the uh, effect of the public discussion is. Uh, again, I find it interesting to think about the the, the relation to mathematics, where, where there isn't, you know, there's 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 very little there's there's very little in the, in the popular press about actually about research mathematics. And every so often something comes up, but it's um, so mathematicians have ha, 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 have more been able to uh, maintain a bit of this this ivory tower um, env environment. And, uh, and the environment of the kind of top research math departments, I found, is much more still um, kind of isolated from these pressures of the uh, of the outside world. But, you know, whether or not a, a, a story about a, some kind of mathematical research appears in the press or not, or on blogs, is not is not something that really affects mathematicians very much. I think there's even it, it might even ha even even have a negative effect. I think mathematicians inherently are kind of feel that, you know what they do is can be very difficult to specialize and not particularly comprehensible to large numbers of people. So, if large numbers of people are talking about it, it they they must not know what they're talking about. And so, th so that's that's true. On the other hand, f physics I think has always had, um, you know, it, it gets into these very deep questions that that you know many, many people, the public, the, wi the wider public, is very very interested in. What is the origin of the universe? How does you know how does the world work at this very very deep level? And so there's a lot more of a fascination and interest in. In, um, in, the, in these questions among uh, among the general public and among, among the press, so I, I don't. I, I guess I, I'm not even sure that I, I really know how a lot of how, how that many physicists feel about this. I think there's very mixed there's very mixed feelings about um, these kind of popular discussions of the subject. I mean, should they just be kind of completely ignored, or um, I guess people feel that. As long as they're kind of going their way, and as long as their own research program is is getting uh, is getting some good press, I guess people feel well that, that that's a good thing. That's gonna help me do what I want to do and help my students get jobs and help me get money. But um, then all of a sudden, when there's some n not so positive attention to uh, their research program, then all of a sudden, then then, they, then they're getting rather get rather upset about it. But it is very different in, in physics and mathematics. So I don't really know. Um, yeah, it's it's very hard to say what um, the actual influence is of such um, articles on the researchers. I mean, of course, um, it's discussed in some way, but um, whether they are actually influenced by it, I don't know. And and, and if, then it could be in a negative way. Right. And w well, one of the most common things that I hear are complaints about journalists. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So especially now with this uh, black holes at the LHC story that I guess you've heard of. Yeah, so, I've heard yeah. of that. That's one thing that I've I, I've done my best on my blog to try to ignore that. Actually, that's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Since I since I unfortunately worked on the topic for a while, this was just not possible for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I. I also have a mixed feeling about but but journalists. I've, I've been it's been interesting in the last few years to I interact a lot with um with with journalists. I mean, I've ended up talking to a bunch of them and then also seeing the stories they write. And there's you know there, there's there's a wide range of, of of things there. I think the the story about black holes at the LHC was something that just didn't deserve much attention and got was kind of unfortunate that it ended up on the front page of the New York Times. But the um the the, the, the coverage in in general, I I, th I think the people who who, who do this? The people who are working on, on this are, you know, I, I, I've often been impressed by them. I mean, you know, they're 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 doing their best to understand some very some, and make sense of some very difficult material and, and communicate it to people. And, and and they really are honestly trying to 
and, and they're they're often very confused with something like string theory, where there where people are telling them opposite things. They're hearing, well, this is this is great, this is wonderful, it's going to explain everything, and no, this is disaster, this is bad, and so they're they're really making a very honest effort to try to understand what's going on. And w- w- what I think, I, what I actually see is more of a problem, more often than kind of bad. Um, you know, people in the press making mistakes and kind of writing bad stories is kind of bad stories being being fed to people in the press. That you have, um, you know, scientists, physicists, especially who who really should know better, and who are kind of promoting some 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 piece of research. They're taking some piece of research, and and, and the standard one that, that there's there's a lot of was that given these critiques of string theory that it wasn't making predictions. You have a lot of people. Who you know did some kind of were doing some kind of research in string theory, which came up with something which wasn't really a prediction, but which could which could somehow be sold as kind of maybe a bit of progress towards making a prediction or something, and then going to the to the press and kind of selling this in a, a not really particularly honest way, and ending up having very misleading um, press stories written about written about this. So uh, I actually think the scientists are as much to blame uh, for uh, kind of the bad press stories that are that are often out there as the uh, members of the press themselves and, and w- w- one of the things I've tried to do in the blog in, in the blog that is to provide a little bit of a counterweight to that so at least when there's inaccurate stories and inaccurate things being sold to the public at least that there, there's somewhere where there's a more um, some kind of discussion of what uh, yeah I think uh, this uh, is that's are. one of the things that blogs can actually do quite well um, you know, if real scientists uh, write them, so um, people can kind of rely on what they say and they comment on newspapers, articles, and so on. Yeah, and, and, and actually, the other interesting thing you know, is I think it's kind of surprised me how much the um, journalists are, are actually following the blogs. Perhaps one of the biggest audiences for the blogs at this point is the, the journalists themselves, because they're, I think Not they're, really. yeah, no, really, because because they they. they um, I think that they they find that the blogs are good sources of stories of you know things that um that they that, you know, that they've always wanted to know you know what are scientists talking about what's new and uh, and that's certainly one of the main functions of a lot a lot of the blogs is to try to kind of uh, to kind of explain to, to to people at various levels what is kind of new in, in the field that that each of us finds interesting and that's kind of often what we like to want to put up on our blogs and so the so the uh, I'm kind of been been surprised to realize how many um, journalists I have actually. Reading my blog, and it's uh, well, you know, so one of the things that I noticed with these um, newspaper articles is that uh, in many cases, cases it starts with a very good article that has been written by some science journalist who really knows what he's doing and who uh, did some research and talked to the people and so on and so forth, and then you find like ten. Uh, copies of um, yeah. decreasing degree of quality that have been echoed by other newspapers until it's just like completely wrong what was written there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah I find it amusing to see that. So you often, so sometimes the way that goes often is you see some, uh, you know, some some scientist is perhaps contacted by the public relations person, at the, people at their university, and. You know, you know, do you have something new to, 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 to promote the research at the university? And they say, okay, well, here's this. And they tell the public relations person at the university some story about what they're doing, which is pretty straightfor- relatively straightforward and, and reasonable. And then the public relations person at the university then writes a press release, which kind of you know pumps this up and adds all sorts of inaccuracies to it. And, and then the people in the press then read the press release, and then they then change the press release around and make it even more... Um, you know, even more outrageous, and then so it's kind of a game of just yeah. a game of tele telephone. By the time it gets <laughs> gets out there, it's often a, it's not really recognizable as to to, to where what it actually where it actually came from. But yeah, and anyway, I don't know what uh, mm-hmm. I'm not not really sure not really sure what one what one can do about that. I, I guess in terms of the influence of it, I. I it may not actually be on physicists or scientists themselves, but but actually a lot of it is on university administrations. I think one thing about especially U.S. universities are they um, they often have these public relations departments, and they're they're quite obsessed with the idea of uh, of, of the university and its um, people working at the university appearing in the media. So that they, so so they, they they love kind of media attention, whereas many f- scientists are kind of a bit dubious about it. The uh, you have university administrations which are 
you know, very very interested in it, and so and, and they're much so. There's a, a pressure from the university administrations to um, for, uh, 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 on people to kind of get their their names and their work their work in the media, even if they're not, you know, even if as scientists they're not so interested in doing that. Anyway, but I, but I really the other thing about say about blogs, I, I think the thing that I guess interests me is just this question of, of what. I think there are many, many different things you can do with them. So I, I don't really know where what's going to happen with them in the future. I think they're in, in, they're a, a very, very flexible tool, and so it kind of depends upon what people decide to you know, decide to do with them and what they try and do with them. I think in mathematics, there are already there, there's a, there's a lot more interesting research ma- mathematics level blogs actually than physics blogs for some reason. There, there's actually at least. At, there's actually several um, fields medalists who have actually started blogs. One is Terry Tao, one is Alan Kahn, I guess, um, was it Richard Borchards also has had a little bit of a blog. Anyway, so there's, there, there's some, some of, the one thing which, which I haven't seen happen in physics has happened in mathematics, that you have people at the absolute top of the field, you know, who are deciding to, to, to often to, to use this format and to try it out and to try writing something there. So that's been, um, well, p- part of the reason is probably that um, the the blogosphere has kind of a doubtful reputation because, um, well, there have been various cases where insults have been exchanged and, um, well, occasionally um, I talk to people about um, that I'm writing a blog and it, it seems to me that many have the impression that blogs are mostly used for gossiping and um, so, I, well, with writing a blog, I've basically made myself a gossiper. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, so, well, really, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that, that seems to be an impression that many people have. But that might change over the course of time. Yeah, um, I think that... And, and then I there's also, it, speaking it, of time, uh, sorry, um, is that it, it, of course, takes time writing a blog. And, and I guess that's... Um, an investment of time that people do not make uh, lightheartedly. So um, there, there is a certain barrier um, to get across, um, and it, and it's also some kind of a um, well, an, some kind of a threshold effect. I guess if if more people would be doing it, then others would see that it can have some um, positive effect um, in that you. You know, you make make new contacts, and um, it's kind of interesting. So I'm I really enjoy writing the blog. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't I, actually write very much about my own um, research, but um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's hard to um, it, it, it's hard to use as as a tool specifically about research. Cause I, I think just because typically the sorts of things one is thinking about are very very specialized, and the amount the number of people. That you can have an, an interesting conversation about them, or is it really, really limited, and, and, and it's not a very, not necessarily a, a very good format for doing it. Um, so, the, it, it, it's much more effective if if you can, um, if you're things to talk about that that, that, are, that are of wider interest than uh, than, than the, a specialized research topic. And I, I think the whole string theory thing, I, I guess, because of this controversy that was going on, would have gone on with, with the books independently of the blogs. I think it uh, ended up. Uh, it ended up, ended up I, I think, making that this, this physics blogosphere, the theoretical physics blogosphere, a bit, a bit of an unusual, a very unusual place. And we have all these various, some very unusual fanatical characters, like uh, our friend Lubosch, who, um, yeah. So there's in this kind of fanaticism and and, uh, and people throwing around insults and juvenile behavior, and th- that, that sort of thing. I, I really haven't seen el- elsewhere. I mean, it's not. I can't imagine any such a thing going on in any of the kind of research mathematics blogs. So it's been a it's it's peculiar. It's been a peculiar thing, partly due to the string theory controversy, partly due to the fact that there's, I think, a much wider range of interest in the in these fundamental physics issues. I think the number of people out there in the world who kind of want to read about research mathematics is a, a much smaller set than the, pe- than the kind of people who want to, um, you know, to, to find out what research physicists are doing and thinking about cosmology or particle physics. So. I don't know. Maybe as the uh, as the string theory controversy dies down or changes into a different form, as after the LHC results are known, the uh, physics blogosphere may, may may change along with it. 
it's a it's, it's been a very been a very weird weird few years to see an alter to see what's been happening and so not yeah, necessarily. possibly. Uh, I certainly yeah. noticed that uh, many um, young physicists are, have started to write blogs. Some of them are actually quite good. So yeah, th that's an interesting development. Yeah, I think there are there, there certainly are there's, there's, there's slowly there 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 certainly are more and more more and more over time. It's not a I think more people kind of start are starting start doing it and start trying it than um, than then stop. And, and 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 there are certainly are, are are some very very good ones out there. It's uh, I find it. Uh, yeah, I, I've certainly learned a lot from uh, for, from reading many of them. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, but I'm continually asking myself kind of how much you, you're right. The, uh, the the amount of time that goes into that one spends on it is uh, is very non-trivial, and it's kind of I'm continually worrying about whether I might be better off spending my time doing other doing doing, doing other things, or whether is the time invested in this kind of uh, kind of worth it. And it's hard to. One question is whether one can kind of keep, whether there's a, a, enough interesting going on, in, in this to kind of keep talking about and to kind of keep doing it. And so far, I guess I've, I found there has, but I can certainly imagine at some point in the future, just deciding, well, this just uh, is not worth the time that it's it's taking, and I should be doing something else. I don't know how you feel about this. Do you think you'll keep doing this indefinitely, or? Well, it it depends very much on. Um, well, I, I have to apply for new positions this year, right. and uh, then I guess whatever I will do after this will um, constrain how much time I have yeah, yeah. <laughs> left over. So one thing is that my husband constantly complains about it, but um, <laughs> I, I, write, I write very fast, and it takes him a lot of time. Uh, right. This is why he writes so, um, so rarely. So rarely, um, yeah. Yeah, so... It's it's not that I actually invest that much time in it. Um, right, right, yeah. But it's still time. So and yeah, I see yeah. it as a hobby. But um, yeah, it, it it's of course true. It it takes some um, some effort either way. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny. I guess there is a lot of a. Uh, I think yeah. yeah. I think you do have to be get kind of good at just kind of writing things. Uh, writing things fairly quickly. It's a different kind of style of writing than you might be used to. And if you're kind of a perfectionist and try to really, I think at the beginning or at various times, I've been trying to write things much more carefully and, and, and put a lot more effort into, into them. And the problem with the blog, to, if you want to do this in any reasonable time and keep producing some reasonable number of these blog entries and, and, and not have it take over your life, you, you do have to be able to just kind of sit down and write out a write things out write things out fairly quickly without worrying too much about about spending time polishing it or, or making it into, into everything that maybe you would like it to be but um I don't know it it, 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 it continues to be to be interesting I continue to uh, I've also found that, that, that I, I've, I've learned a lot from it just from people um by if you find this also that it, it puts me in contact with all sorts of people I wouldn't otherwise be in contact with and, and if, yeah. if, if I write you yeah. know and, and, and if you write about something that you're interested in, you then and, and often end up hearing from other people who who know things about this that you don't know about. Which uh, yeah, that's and, true. And I noticed the same thing. It's uh, occasionally it's really useful. Yeah, and so 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 so, so that that's that's very good. But um, yeah, I don't know. The the, the, the matter the amount of time is uh, can be kind of demanding. It'll be interesting to see what happens and. With it all in a few years, I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, would certainly be interesting to watch these developments. So it yeah. it happens really fast on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, so is there anything else? I mean, maybe we should be getting. Uh, yeah. Um, doing this. So yeah. Maybe any, we any, should any wrap up or so. Wrap up. So, are there any other th any other th things that we haven't talked about that you'd really like to? Yeah, lots of, things, <laughs> but, lots of things. Lots of yeah. Uh, there's many to talk <laughs> about, but. For today, um, I think that will do. Okay, well, that's good. Anyway, well, I'm glad we could do this. I was glad to get a chance to meet you at least virtually. We've had we've communicated by email in the past, but now it's been much interesting to ha have this conversation. I hope other yeah. people find it similarly interesting, and maybe we'll have more to talk about in the future sometime. Yeah, it was interesting to talk to you. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I guess maybe that that's it for now. Okay, okay. bye now. <laughs> Bye. Bye.